This conference will now be recorded. 2021. Uh, before I do, I'd like to uh, make this statement about our uh, nature of our emergency. Uh, due to the nature of the declaration of the state of emergency, due to the novel coronavirus COVID-19 pursuant to code 2.2-3708.2, this meeting is to be held by electronic communications via the web platform GoToMeeting. The catastrophic nature of this declared emergency makes it impractical and unsafe to assemble a quorum in a single location. And the purpose of this meeting is to discuss the transact the business statutorily required or necessary to continue operations for the of the public body. A video recording of the meeting will be posted to the policy committee webpage at www.campo. Dot gwregion.org slash policy committee. Have any questions? Please contact Ian Aulis. He is our uh, FAMPO administrator, transportation director. So, first, uh, next item on the agenda is to determine the, the quorum and a roll call. Ms. Stacy Pike, she will be calling roll call, wherever she is. She's on yep. there. Yep, I'm here. Um, it, just a quick note on the Facebook live stream. Um, I see Manuj commented, we were live on Facebook. It was muted except for one second um, oh. before we started. Okay, thank you. To start roll call, we have Chair Cindy Shelton. Here. Mark Dudenheffer. Here. Crystal Manuj. Here. Meg Baumke. Thomas Cohen. Here. Here. We have Meg, thank you. Tim McLaughlin. Chris Yakubowski. Dave Ross. Here. Vin Marshall. Ooh. Oh, Kevin. Deborah Frazier. No, uh, Kevin's here. I'm sorry. I thought she said Ben. I'm sorry. Yeah, Deborah Fraser. Gary Skinner. Matthew Kelly. Here. Jason Graham. Here. Tim Baruti. Here. Doug Fawcett. Mark Whitley, Ann Kupka, here, Kathy Binder, Jeffrey Silly, correct me if I said that wrong, Jeffrey Black, Mark Whitley, Actually, I think we've called you twice, Mark. Jamie Jackson. Here. Aiden Quirk. Here. Rob Schneider. Here. Joseph Stainsby. Yeah. Betsy Massey. Marcy Parker. Here. Michelle Shopsar. Here. Susan Gardner. Here. Stephen Haynes. Here. Tanya Holland. Richard Duran. Here. Todd Horsley. Here. Sierra Williams. Cedric Rucker. David McLaughlin. Wouldn't miss it for the world. <laughs> Al Durante. And I concludes roll call and we do have um, a quorum. 
Madam Chair, I could just um, say that if we could just ask everybody online, if they're not speaking, if they could just mute their microphones so that we don't get feedback. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, did you guys hear that? All we're asking you to do is to mute your microphone if you're not speaking. The next item, before we get started, I wanted to remind you that the way that we do our votes today is that we will uh, only do a roll call vote if we receive opposition to a particular motion. So we'll be calling for a group vote, and then as long as there's no opposition, we'll just move on from there. All right. Uh, so the first item on the, our next item on the agenda is the approval of the March 15th tonight's policy committee agenda. Sorry. Thank you. Second. Second. Okay. Second. <clears throat> uh, all who agree, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. Yeah. Okay. Any abstentions? One. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Okay, thank you. And then Chair Rose Aye, motion carries. Next item on the agenda is public involvement. Do we have anyone that's online that wants to uh, ask any questions or comments from the members of the public? Hearing none, moving on to the next item. Uh, just a reminder, please, and thank you. Someone just muted their mic. That was excellent. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the February 22nd policy committee minutes. Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I'll move the consent agenda as submitted. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a motion and second. Any discussion? <clears throat> Okay. All who agree say aye. 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 All who oppose say nay. Any abstentions? Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the FAMPO Administrator's Report. Mr. Ian Aulis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've got um, our team putting the slides up for you on the screen. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. It's not a very long report tonight. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, but there are a couple of things that I thought the committee should pay attention to. So if we can move, um, I'm going to look at the freight corridors, uh, just another regional transportation uh, overview, and some office updates. Next slide. So this is just my monthly output for transportation, as I do every month uh, for anyone who's new online. First item. CMAC SDBG. This is just a reminder if we've sent notices out, everybody's been informed, but just reminding the localities and any eligible agencies to submit their CMAC and or SDBG project allocations by that date, March the 22nd. As you know, the policy committee at the previous meeting approved the new um, privatization methodology amendment. We now need to get the projects in, so just remind all of your localities, please send in their projects and then we'll be able to begin the process of doing scoring. Next slide. This item I just picked up to do with the census. And I want us just to pay a little attention to this. The Census Bureau has proposed some changes to the criteria of how they define an urban area and how they're gonna map an urban area. And I put this in the agenda because I just think that our locality should pay attention to this. The, the link is on there so that if anybody needs to find it, they can click on the link and it will take them straight to the Census Bureau's uh, <coughs> website, which explains the amendments. But there's some subtle changes to how they're going to classify an urban area. In the past, there were, for example, uh, less dense areas that fell in a kind of loop around or in between areas of highly dense development that were considered urban. And they just drew a straight line and included those less dense areas. For example, they're not going to do that anymore. So any areas like that which might have been included in the past as part of the urban area because they're highly dense are not going to be included. They're going to be excluded. That's just one subtle change. So I would just encourage um, the city and Spotsylvania and Stafford to just ask their um, city officials and the, the, the county officials to just look at that list of proposed changes because they've asked for public comment. So this is the opportunity to say, hang on, we don't like this. If we don't say anything before that date, 
uh, May the 20th, they're going to proceed with the changing the ways that they make those changes. Just, Ian, could you take that and translate it into a how that affects us or would affect us if this had been in place the last time we went? So there are lots of little details and I can't like give you every detail, but what is going to happen is is that it it's it's the detail that changes. The big picture doesn't change enormously. But what they define mm -hmm. as within the urban boundary is going to change in some instances. And that's why I say that each locality must look at it because it's not a one size fits all. They're changing for example, how they count certain categories. They're changing the way they draw a line around the less dense areas. In the past, they used to try and draw more straight lines, which meant that some less dense areas got included in the urban area calculation. Now, they're not gonna do that. They're gonna strict, stick strictly to what is the, the count, the actual definition of, of an urban area by number of people or number of households. So you're not going to benefit by having that bit extra anymore. It's going to, they're going to draw a curvy line around those sorts of areas because they say with it with modern tools, we no longer need to have all these straight lines. We can actually now cope with complicated boundaries of the city of Fredericksburg or of Stafford or Spotsylvania if there are such areas. And I don't have um, a map right now of what was done in 2010 in front of me, but there are these curvy lines which they did away with. They're now not going to do that anymore. So it may mean that the population calculation may be slightly different. It might be that the number is slightly lower that's included in what's called the urban area now than what was done previously. But of course, all localities have basically grown a little since the last um, uh, time this was delineated. So it sounds like more of a technical it's a change. It's a bunch of technical changes, but I just think that each locality's planners, city planners and staff should have a look at these things just to make sure that when you apply to your particular area, it's not going to disadvantage you later because they're going to count what's urban and what's rural slightly differently. I don't think it's going to affect the city much because it's all urban, right? There are very few not urban areas. But particularly in Stafford and Spotsylvania, what they define as urban, there are going to be some little changes. It might not be significantly big, but there are going to be a couple of little changes. So I would just ask my chief planner in the counties to just have a look at that a little more carefully. Anyway, the, the link is there, so you don't have to wonder where to find it. You just click on that link and it gives you the full explanation with all of the criteria. Next slide. Frank. The reason this is important is because it's becoming known that the growth of freight is contributing towards congestion in our area. Freight is growing faster than ordinary cars traffic. So we've got a double-edged sword here. More cars on the road, more congestion. More freight on the road, also more congestion. And we maybe haven't thought as much about freight. That map over there shows the current federal delineation of what they consider to be <laughs> the key freight corridors in Virginia, all right? And on the 24th of March, Hoytby, our state body, is going to announce an additional range of critical freight corridors that are in addition to those. So that includes, you can see there, I-95 the and the road down to Norfolk and so on, but there are going to be some regional ones that Hoytby is going to announce as their proposal for what additional roads should be considered critical freight corridors. And those delineations factor into when they're calculating whether to upgrade a road or whether further studies need to be done and so on. So that is an interesting, and we've asked one of our team members to go to that um, workshop on the 24th to find out what those additional proposals are. But as you know, I've been mentioning a couple of times that in the future, perhaps in the next financial year, we should do a freight study to see how much is the freight traffic affecting us and where is the freight coming from and where is it going to? And if it's all going to end up on I-95 and some on the rail, that's a lot of freight on a small number of roads and, and the, the, the rail system. Next excuse slide. Me, excuse me, Mr. Allen. Yes, sure. uh, On the designation of the critical freight corridors, is that going to be pushed down to us or do we have any say in that? 
So the workshop on the 24th is to announce their proposal. Proposed. So okay. we'll bring you that information after the 24th. So presumably at the next policy committee meeting, we can bring you their proposal. They bring it in a workshop mm. format. Okay. So presumably they'll take inputs and questions and all that okay. kind of thing. But these are the state is responding. So the ones you have there are the federal ones. The state is now saying, well, what additional ones should we be including in that designation of critical? And we'll find out what the proposals are. Go ahead, Mr. Ron. So um, do you, does your staff still have the ability to do some things with, I think they were using something from Google Maps, that, but that, that wasn't the name of it, to look at traffic? Like, for instance, I'm sure 17. Are, are you able to decipher from some kind of modeling system yeah. that uses real-world GPS data what's what rate is going down 17, Route 3, and Highway 20? Yeah, so we do have software available that can count the traffic. Um, and um, it's called street light data, and we do have the street light data available to us through the spade, and so we download that and we, and we, we can, intend using that. Can it that. differentiate between normal regular traffic and freight? I believe it can, yes. I've got some DMs on you if you want to get the detail, but I believe that okay. you can do that. Yeah. And for our east-west mobility study, I intend using street light to identify where do trips start and where do they end. And you can find out where most of the trips go to using that data. So we're looking at using that data in the new financial year with that new project. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Next. Costing major, major roads. This is not a new item. You remember last time we had a couple of laughs because I pointed out a few intersections and everybody had. So I've got some answers for you today instead of questions. On the four. Um, Dangerous crossings that I pointed out. I've got some answers through DDOT. The Carl D. Silver Parkway one, in that particular case, it's up to the city to, to interfere there. VDOT will not interfere, they'll leave it to the city to either put in a crossing or not put in a crossing. The second one, um, Route 3. This I did not know about, and you might find this interesting. Uh, VDOT has appointed a consultant to study the Route 3 corridor and look at dangerous intersections. And so they're going to, they have asked their consultant to look at pedestrian crossings as well through, through that corridor. So there is a consultant that's just been appointed to actually look into mm -hmm. those things. So we caught it at the right time because at least somebody's going to be doing some work on that. Lila Road, in this particular case, um, VDOT has no particular plans at the train station to put a crossing. And they've said that they'll, the staff will go back and have another look at it after I read it. But there may be no funding currently available to do anything there, and they could work with the county of Stafford. If there's no funding, they could allow Stafford to do it under permits. So the answer to the question that um, Mr. McLaughlin asked me last time is: the counties are allowed to do um, crossings like that, but under permits. They have to apply to VDOT. VDOT checks that it's safe to do it, and so on and so on, and they will allow you under permit to do it. And then the final one. Mm -hmm. Um, at the 7-Eleven, Deacon Road, and Leland Road is also in um, Stafford. That particular one, they have a project in the area, and so they're going to add on um, doing a street crossing to a project that's already on the go to do a sidewalk in that particular area. So they, VDOT will do that one, I believe, for us, which would be rather nice. Next slide. So that answers the question, is that different things work in different places. Great to answer. I spoke last time also about this. Here's just an update. You see the hours that they're starting used to be later. And I said last time that they, the new leadership at Fred had indicated that they would like to, from the new year, start earlier service with the permission of the board and you know they're getting approval. But those are some much better starting times. You can see that it's not starting at 6 30 a.m. You know, and I said last time if you start a bus at 8 a.m. and everybody needs to get to work, that bus is not going to help you. But if the bus would start operating at 6.30 a.m. and in some cases 7.30 a.m., this is going to help people get to work. And I think this is a great step forward and we should congratulate Fred on doing it. And the, the various routes are listed there. I want to bore you with the, you know, you've got this resource that's going to be posted on the web as well. People can look at it. Next one. And then this is just Saturday service, uh, which we also spoke about last time. There are the, the routes that are going to give 10 hour service on the major routes on Saturdays. So now I'm also going to get improved Saturday service on the Fred bus system, which I think is another great thing 
to help and it will increase their ridership numbers. What we found elsewhere in the country is that if you offer weekend service, your midweek service tends to, your, your, your ridership numbers tend to grow as well. And we think the logic for that as planners is that when people start to use it on the weekend, they get used to using it, they like it, and then they start using it during the week as well. So it tends to boost the week numbers as well if you offer Saturday shows. So we think that's a good improvement. Next slide. Way forward, okay. So project updates. The East West Mobility Study. The recommended project selections are going to be included in the draft, the draft six year improvement program, which is going to be presented at the Commonwealth Transportation Board in April. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to find out whether we're getting funding to do that. So that's very soon. The mobility and accessibility survey that I've been talking about, we found a way that we can actually do this through the LRTP because we're going to do another survey for the LRTP anyway. So we're going to combine the additional questions that I wanted to have to find out where people drive, why they go in their car, why they don't take a train or a bus. We can ask them in that same survey and not have to duplicate and send out another survey and another survey and another survey. We can roll them all into one and do one big survey. So that's how I'm going to handle that. As I said to you, we should look at a freight study in the future, and we're still looking for funding to fund the freight study, but it's on my agenda. And we've begun work with Spotsylvania and Fredericksburg linking the trails on the BCR right of way. So we've got some trails, and then there are gaps, which I showed you in my very first presentation. So we had a first meeting with the, um, Paul and others from, from Spotsylvania, and with um, Jamie from the city and our staff, and we're looking at the projects that have been in the pipeline that have never been completed or there's a problem with one of the projects or whatever else and we're starting to see if we can get some progress on each of those items nothing to report except to say at least i've got some people together and we're investigating it so we have to give you some feedback as time moves on next i spoke about the long april agenda tonight's is a quick one unless you all decide to have a long discussion okay. about something but this one, just to give you an idea of the amount of work the staff are doing, just look at those items. Those are all large items. And we're going to be bringing them to you in April. Some of them for a decision, some of them for information. But there's a, there's a bunch. The CMAX course, we will hopefully have them done by next meeting. The draft allocations, we will hopefully have done by the next meeting. The tip equity analysis, that's already um, largely done. One of our staff, Jordan, has been working on that and is doing a great analysis. The UPWP draft we're working on for the new one. There's an amendment coming. The roadway scoring methodology we've almost completed. Uh, we've showed you already a draft of, of that. The transit scoring, we've, we've got a draft in process. Hopefully we'll have it uh, ready to show again then. And the bike pad draft scoring we've just started. Hopefully we'll have something to show you as well. The 2025 CLRP amendment, because of the smart scale round that was announced, we've got to do an amendment to bring some of those projects in that were not in the, the CLRP, which is part of the LRTP, as probably most of you know. Public participation plan updates. And my I can tell you now that the RFP um, for the new on-call contract for consultants for FAMPO. Um, I've got the responses from VDOT, from the GWRC staff, and from the lawyer. And all of those comments have been incorporated, so basically it's good to go. I'll present the draft to the TAC just for them to look at it, and it will come to you at the next meeting. So I think you can see, Chair, that we have a sizable amount of work going on simultaneously at FAMPO, and I think the staff are doing a great job at the moment of getting through it. We'll present it to you at the next meeting. So a lot of work happening. Ms. Charles, before you change, do you have a UPC for each one of those items that's direct? So that way you're tracking how much time and money is being spent on each one of those items? Yes, we have a thing called Clockwise, which is a mm -hmm. software package, and we have to track every hour that we spend. So we're tracking all of that, and it monthly goes through into a database. So we know um, because for our various funding sources, we have to indicate how much money we're spending on the different um, funding streams. And so we have to keep a record of that, and every staff member has to go and fill in on clockwise what they did today. So, okay. so we do keep a good record of it. <clears throat> Next item. 
just our starting plan. The first two columns you've seen, I presented that at the beginning. Then the final change, and I think this is this is the last change. And you can see, if you look at the first column, we have lots of part-timers and interns and all that sort of thing. And I've been trying to move to full-time planning staff, which are the people that do all that work you saw on the previous slide. So what I have, the, the change that I make here is, and this is May, so it's not all implemented yet, but it's the 1st of May, which I've been implemented. I have uh, advertised for a new planner and shut down the position of executive administrative assistant. I found that I didn't need that position as much as perhaps um, it was needed in the past. And I'd rather use the funds to employ a planner who's going to be doing hard work for of planning, which you're going to see on the next agenda. You're going to get a truckload of work already done and to do that. So that's the only change I've made. And I think there won't be any changes for a good long time now. I think we're pretty much at the end of restructuring that. And I'm very happy with where we are. Next slide. Uh, that's it from me. As I said, I'll try and keep it short and to the point. Do we have any questions for Mr. Ollis? Mr. Kelly? I just want when when the TAC meets again before our next meeting, can we please get the answer to the question that we've been we the city have been asking for months now of um, how are we gonna fund when we took the, the money out of GWI CMAC money and redesignated it with the final sport decision. But TAP said we will come back with a plan showing how that funding can be replaced. Okay, I'll ask. Now I've been for it for like five months. I just kind of wondered. Okay, I'll ask the chairperson of the TAP to specifically um, come with an answer from, from the relevant people. The Kate from GWRC is making a follow up presentation at the TAP next meeting, I hope. Um, not sure if that's already put on the agenda, but I think she's requested. To have a follow up and we'll certainly um, ask for some feedback for you at the next meeting. All right, thank you. Mr. Kelly, I'll make sure it's on the agenda. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Allen. So, next item on our agenda is Resolution 21 23, uh, approving the TPB MOU. Uh, Mr. Allen, you're going to present this as well? Yeah, Chairperson, and this. This particular item has been on your agenda at the policy committee for a number of meetings. And you'll remember we told you at the previous meeting, we're not asking for any decision at this stage. We just wanted to show you the item. So we do need to move towards a decision. Um, the tech looked at it at this past tech meeting for, for the second time and did not request any changes to the, to the amendments. So in other words, the policy committee approved a draft after removing several clauses from the agreement. It went back to the TPB. The TPB staff have sent us back this request to put back in some of the deletions that we removed. We've now sent it through the TAC. They didn't make any changes to the amendments which were put back into this draft. And we're now bringing it to the policy committee. So in your pack is the draft with the amendments requested by uh, from TPP. Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm not going to belabor the point. It's it's we've gotten this this point. So, but the only thing that's concerning me is because we have this discussion as a policy board all the time. Their policy board has responded to the last draft we sent them. We're getting all the responses from their staff. We're not getting responses from their policy board. And I'm just a, a little concerned, more of a you know, procedural, is the policy board even looking at this or is this all they direct by staff? My understanding, they're not voting on it. I mean, if you want to vote on it, it's fine. Uh, there's nothing in there that's all under checking. I'm just kind of concerned that all our nego we're negotiating, we're bringing back the policy committee, we're making our recommendations, staff's taking and setting it up, they're hitting their staff, and it's going right back to the staff. This is not on the policy committee. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're voting on it tonight either. Are they, they're, they could vote off to next month. So, uh, Mr. Kelly Moore is correct on the facts. The, the TPB have come back to us after we said, fine, we'll put it on our policy committee agenda for this date for a vote. They came back to us and said um, they can't put it on this month's agenda for some other agenda uh, thing of theirs. It's going only in April. So in other words, we have set it up, we've teed it up that both committees would vote in March. 
but they're not. They're only starting their process of, of going through and voting in a, month, in a month's time. So we we would, if we do, we would vote on it tonight. They would only deal with it next month. So you, you're correct. I, again, I'm only, I think things are changing with, with census and everything anyway, that's going to make some of this move anyway. But it's just a little disconcerting that one, it was the TPB that said we had to get to do it right now, right now, right now, right now. Now it's come to here, and now they're putting it off again. And it turns out that the policy committee's not even getting the stuff, it's hitting the staff, and the staff sending it back to us. And then we're sitting here talking as a policy board on what we want to do, and their policy board doesn't even look at it yet. That's probably correct. I, 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 I have no information. So, I mean, whatever you guys want to do is fine. It's just really kind of strange that the way they're operating this. Mm -hmm. So do we have a motion for uh, resolution 2123? Yeah. Oh, so moved. Okay. okay. Motion to approve. Yeah. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Duhamper. Okay. Uh, do we have any discussion? Additional discussion, I should say. All right. Uh, all those agree, say aye. Uh, aye. All those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? Chair votes aye, motion passes. Madam Chair, when will they, so now that we voted on it, will... Tell them their next meeting in April. They will... They will they make any changes? They will, yes. That That is the one question. I mean... If they make any changes to it, then it's going to come right back to us again. They're going to get it in April, and if they're not happy with our and their staff <laughs> input, <laughs> there's no guarantee, but we did email them <laughs> ask this question, and they said... It, it just seemed weird that they made a big deal. It does. They made such a... It didn't deal. make a big it didn't make sense at the time. Yeah. And now they're not even attending. Okay. And again, they make one change and it comes right back to us all over It is it is a it is a little unusual, but I'll join me in prayer for that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next item on the agenda, item B is the RFP for the on call consultants update, Mr. Ollis. Yeah, so I've uh, basically covered this. We've got um the response from VDOT. They're basically happy with it, just a couple of administrative details they want to change, which I've done. The, the lawyer for GWRC has looked at it. Also, a couple of very minor edits he wanted done, they're done. Um, and so the thing is essentially good to go. We're just going to format it and then send it to the TAC for any comment they may have and then bring it to the policy committee. It'll be on your agenda next time. If you approve it, then we'll put it out for expressions of interest from the industry and hopefully we can get some new on-call contracts so that any new work we do in the future, uh, we've got them in place to be able to do that. So, Since it's a contract, don't we have to go to our fiscal agent, GWRC? So we've sent them the RFP draft. and They have uh, given their changes, and which we've incorporated, and their attorney has looked at it and he's happy with it. The actual contract will be between GWRC as our fiscal agent and the on-call contractors. Sure. So it, we will use their standard contract. We won't use a funny kind of uh, amended contract. We will use their standard contracts to do that. But the RFP had to indicate what services we would like, sure. transportation planning, engineering, and all these kind of things, which we have to put in there, which I do. Any questions for Mr. Hollis on the RFP? No. You'll get it next time. Okay. Okay. All right, so we're not voting on that tonight. No, no, no question. Next time on the agenda is GWR Right Connect funding update. Ms. Kate Gibson, I think this is related to, or maybe related to what Mr. Kelly was asking. Yes, good evening. Thank you all for having me. Um, my name is Kate Gibson. I'm currently the interim executive director at GWRC, and part of my role is to oversee the GW Right Connect program. Um, as Chair Shelton mentioned, this is in response to Mr. Kelly's request from the January Policy Committee to take a look at GWRI Connect funding, funding and ensure the long-term sustainability of the program. Um, so we gave this presentation to the TAC this month as well as the CTAC. So just really quickly, if anyone um, online is not familiar with GWI Connect, we are the transportation demand management program for this region. Uh, we serve all of Planning District 16. 
And just a high level definition of TDM, um, it is basically anything that either reduces travel demand or redistributes travel demand. So the image at the bottom of the slide kind of um, illustrates this. It's getting people out of their single occupant vehicles into other modes of transportation, or it's having them flex their hours or telework so that their car is not on the road during peak congestion times. And this is just an illustration um, that the traffic jam could be kind of um, solved through carpools, van pools, and commuter buses. Um, and then this is just the goal of the program, um, promote, plan, and establish transportation alternatives to the single occupant vehicle, as I mentioned, improving air quality, reducing congestion, and improving quality of life. So just a little bit of background, um, kind of where Mr. Kelly's request came from. Um, the CMAC STBG prioritization methodology, which you all amended at your last meeting, includes a section about um, TDM operations and GWI Connect, and it stipulates that a base amount of $125,000 of annual CMAC funding will be allocated on an off-the-top basis to GWI Connect to help support their program. So this is the, the language from the actual methodology um, document. And so for many years, GWI Connect did receive this allocation. That funding level fluctuated between 125,000 and 225,000, um, but we did receive that for several years. And then back in June of 2020, last year, um, the FAMPO Policy Committee voted to reallocate our out-year funding, specifically FY22 through FY25, um, and that totaled $500,000. So at that time, the FAMPO TAC committed to helping GW Ride Connect identify and ex explore funding sources to help keep the program whole. So this slide compares our projected FY22 budget to our FY20 budget. I'm not comparing to FY21 because that budget was a little wonky due to COVID. Um, but you can see the first line is that CMAC off the top allocation. So obviously that's been removed. Um, we get, well, we've currently received two DRPT grants, so rideshare and van pool. And you can see that the funding has shifted between those two grants, but the total has remained the same. This year, we have applied for a new grant. So that's the DRPT Advantage Grant that will fund our operations related to the Van Pool Self uh, Advantage Van Pool Self Insurance Program. Um, our CMAC funding is a little bit lower than it was in FY20. That's because we reduced the number of spaces that we're leasing. Uh, we're working with Caroline County to potentially lease some spaces in Ladysmith. Um, and then we had a Van Start grant that ended in FY20. Um, so I'll just note that the DRPT grants are not a done deal. Um, as Mr. Aulis mentioned in his presentation, um, the STIP goes or the SIP goes to uh, the CTB next month, so we'll have a better idea then um, if these grants have been funded. So um, just to kind of draw out more from that slide. Um, as I mentioned, we submitted this additional grant application for 75,000. Um, if that grant is awarded, our budget reduction from FY20 will be about $65,000. If it's not, then the hole is a lot bigger at $140,000. So we've been able to make some budget adjustments between our FY20 and FY22 um, budgets. So the first, as I mentioned, we were able to reduce those lease, co uh, lease parking spaces, and so that reduced our cost there. Um, the second is that we've been able to reduce our GWC staffing budget. So a couple things, we um, had been funding a part of the executive director's time related to section 5307 funding, we've removed that. And we've also um, made some changes to fringe and indirect rates that have affected our, our staffing budget. So the bottom line is if the $75,000 Advantage grant is awarded, we will be whole for FY22. However, we do have a funding need that we're currently not able to meet. Um, and so we're in need of funding 
for a GWRI Connect strategic plan. Um, this is required in order for us to continue receiving DRPT funding. And from the couple slides back where I showed you kind of our budget for next year, without the CMAC allocation, the DRPT funding makes up the vast majority of our budget and all of the budget that supports um, personnel costs. So the, um, the strategic plan is not an eligible cost under our DRPT commuter assistance program funding, which is what we're currently receiving. It is eligible under DRPT's technical assistance funding, but that requires a 50% local match, which we're not able to do at this time. Um, the original deadline for completion of the strategic plan was gonna be January 1st, 2022, um, but DRPT is adjusting the timeline due to COVID-19. So we have kind of a two-pronged solution that we'd like to propose for this. Um, so the first is to use most of our remaining FY21 CMAC funding for the strategic planning effort. We would begin this spring and then conclude it in FY22. Um, as of January 31st, we had 62% of our funding remaining. Um, and then we also are projecting additional savings due to the resignation of GBRC's executive director and some um, staffing reorganization that's happening in, in, in the interim period. The second part is to request FAMPO staff's assistance with data analysis for the plan. Um, and we would request that that's included in the FY22 UPWP under trans, uh, TDM planning. And so that's already a section that's a part of the UPWP. We would just request that this be one of the deliverables. And you can see the types of work that would be needed for that. And um, I believe that that would be a really good fit um, given FAMPO staff's skill set, um, mostly help with data and mapping. So that concludes my presentation. Happy to take any questions. Go ahead, Mr. Wong. Thank you, Madam Chair. What other sources than CMAC does GWRC have as sources of funding? All right, do you mean for the GW Riot Connect program or just in general? Both. So for the GW Ride Connect program, um, we receive, well, we were receiving CMAC, we received DRPT funding, um, and then we're working with Caroline County on local funding for the, the lease spaces there. Um, we also match the DRPT grants with local funding. Um, so those are basically the, the main sources of funding for GW Ride Connect. As far as our overall budget, um, it's, you know, a combination of federal, state, and federal and state grants, um, and then local funding through dues from the localities. Um, and then we have a few other kind of private sources, or we have some pass-through funding that flows through GWRC as well. Thank you. Go ahead. Hey, what's, what's the uh, projected cost of a strategic plan? So I'm projecting that it would be somewhere between fifty and sixty-five thousand um, dollars, just depending on which portions we want to ask a consultant to help with, um, versus what we'll do in-house or what FAMPO staffing will be able to assist with. So I'm just curious, could this be the first time that GWRC would ever have a strategic plan or there's nothing, it just seems kind of expensive um, to create, but I guess I don't know exactly what you need to, to put in it as far as details go. I know so, the county counties was much less, but it was just a bunch of supervisors meeting one Saturday. <laughs> so, can, I, can I answer that question? It's, it's also, uh, I just find it odd that we're going to you hire a consultant to set up your strategic plan. That should be set by the folks that are going to be enacting the plan. Uh, it's kind of hard to get somebody to come in from the outside and tell you exactly what you're going to be doing because that's, that's, your, that's your goals and objectives for your organization. So I will say to that question, I think it's going to be a combination. We've done several strategic plans over the last couple of years. Um, and there are, to your point, um, Mr. Marshall, there are definitely certain things that staff needs to weigh in on. They, they're the ones doing the work every day and they kind of know the lay of the land. 
Um, where it's helpful to bring a consultant in is to help facilitate the conversation, um, to help structure the conversation, make sure we're staying on task. And then the other piece with GWRI Connect is there's a lot of kind of emerging best practices in the field that staff may or may not be aware of, examples from other communities um, where people are doing really innovative things that the consultant would be able to bring to us um, and kind of give us options of things that we would be able to do in the future to you know, take the program in a new direction. Um, so I think that's one benefit. The other piece for this plan is that we have to have a, uh, develop a marketing strategy. So we'll need to hire some sort of marketing consultant to help us develop that. So it's kind of two pieces. It's a consultant to help facilitate the kind of um, typical mission, vision, values, goals, objective strategies, that kind of thing. And then it's also somebody to help us do the marketing analysis and um, marketing strategy. So the plan for Austin, um, we've agreed basically as a staff that we're quite happy to do the data. So the data analysis we can do in-house, but obviously we've still got to enter into clockwise who we're charging for those hours. So we still have to build the hours to somebody. So we can't, every hour of my staff have to indicate who's paying for that hour, otherwise I'm. Mm -hmm. I understand that, Mr. Kelly. But we, are, we have agreed that we would be prepared to do the, the data analysis and the maps and the stuff that you can see there. Mr. Kelly. Yeah, first off, okay, thank you for dealing with the situation and putting everything together to try to get us at least to the next year. But the original intent, let me step back. Even VDOT, has finally come to the conclusion that we can't build our way out of the situation we're in. The transit is going to become more and more important moving forward. At the same time, I fully understand, especially with staff responsibility in Canada, there's still a lot of road-related issues with secondary road systems and things that are problems. And I've, we've had a lot of angst on the, on the layout of funding because there's so many different pots and it's laying out all over there. But this is a critical program that frankly has not gotten the, the press that really deserves because it's up there with uh, the VRE in moving people up and down the roads on a regular basis. And the fact when we agreed to do this, it was understood that we would be looking at outlying years and the funding for it. And frankly, the only really funding that's out there that can meet that goal is CMAC funding. That's the only thing that we can really commit to that outside. Everything else is going to be well, if we get this grant this year and this grant that year, it, it's going to be hobbling this thing together for the next five years. And I'm hoping that we will come to some understanding that we've got to get beyond that if we're going to keep this program up and running. And while it has its problems now because of COVID, everybody's telling us is that coming out of this, this is still, and VRE are still going to be critical components. And we'll be looking at expanding these programs, not cutting them back. So I'm just hoping that we can get beyond some of this discussion on CMAC. Another issue that's come up, and I was only advised this, I don't know if Dr. Schneider wants to chime in on it, is there's CARES Act fund that was for transit in play too, as long as the 5307 issue, which we've now been talking about for months, that we need to get resolved and how we're going to move forward. Because now, as I understand it, because we can't get our act together on the 5307 issue, there's a pot of money sitting there, and we're now putting VR, we're VRE is getting a little annoyed, PRTC is getting a little annoyed, FETC is getting a little annoyed because this money hasn't allocated yet because we're still talking about it. And so when the next round of funding comes, it's going to affect potentially MBTC, VRE, PRTC and their funding because we're, we're not spending the money. And so I'm hoping in the next meeting or so that we, again, I fully understand the issues that you know, I've always said this, Fredericksburg in the grand scheme of things is relatively small. The big solutions is really outside our, our domain into, into the counties. And I understand the secondary road issues specifically in the counties. But we've got to come to an understanding what these funds can be used for, agree to it, and move forward on these projects. And this is a critically important project. So I'm just asking if we can have some serious conversations and bring these to the finish line, because now our inability to come to conclusion on some of this discussion to setting ramifications that are going well outside our region. And it's not putting us in the best of light. And I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that, but that's where we're at right now. Yeah, I'd like to comment on it because there's been months that we could have been discussing this, but we didn't have meetings. And so I don't think that should count into that. And then uh, what I, a question I had for you, Leah, is that 
in one hand, on one part of it, you're saying that, that GW Right Connect is the designated TDM planning group, right? But yet, when you get down to here, you're going, no, we're not going to do it. We're going to have FAMPO do it. So who is TDM? And so is GDW Right Connect all TDM or just that portion of TDM? That's a great question. This is something that I actually kind of illustrated on a presentation that I believe I gave to the GWRC board, so some of you might not have seen it. Um, but I actually attended a conference where they talked about there's kind of two levels of TDM. There's the planning level, and then there's also you know, making sure that there are TDM options and that kind of thing. And then there's also working with people to connect them to those options. And so that for me really helps kind of distinguish GW Ride Connect's role versus FAMPO's role. So as I mentioned, FAMPO's UPWP has always included a TDM, TDM planning section. It's my understanding that TDM planning is a piece of what FAMPO is you know kind of required to do as an MPO and you know along with transit planning and road planning and all these kinds of things. Um, GW Ride Connect is really more of a commuter assistance program. So we get people that call in and they're like, I live here, I work here, these are my hours, and we help them kind of assess all of their different options. So it's kind of two separate functions, um, but there's definitely synergy there. And so um, you know, definitely, I think helping, asking FAMPO to help with the, the data and mapping side of it, and more of the planning side, whereas GW Rag Connect will be more focused on kind of the program implementation side. So I'm out of GWRC. What did y'all do with the money that was given back to you from the million dollars? What did you guys do with that? I'm sorry, um, you cut out a bit. The money that was given back from Fred? Yeah, last year, uh, CARES Act gave a certain amount of money to Fred and BRE, but I'm talking specifically from Fred, and Fred gave money back to GWRC. And so what did you guys do with that money? Did you not put it for GW Right Connect? What did you do with that million dollars? So Fred did not give funding back to GWRC. Um, so just to kind of clarify how 5307 funding works, um, Fred gets 5307 funding through the state. Um, we also generate 5307 through the VAMCO Alliance that comes down through the Washington urbanized area. Um, and so then that money um, actually goes to PRTC. The GWRC board, is responsible for allocating those funds, but the funds don't actually come to the GWRC board physically. They stay with PRTC, and then PRTC um, enters into subrecipient agreements with anyone that that funding is allocated to. Um, so we have allocated funding, 5307 funding, to FRED through the Vampool Alliance pot of funding. Um, there also was CARES Act funding that was generated through the Vampo Alliance that has been allocated to GWRC. To date, we've only spent a little under $40,000 of that funding um, to help purchase PPE for the van pool operators. Um, but otherwise, that funding um, has not been allocated yet. Okay, thank you. I'll go pull the meeting minutes because I misremembered that conversation. So my apologies. Okay. I'll pull the meeting minutes and save my own questions for later offline. Any other questions? Madam Chair? Uh, go ahead, Mr. Graham. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gibson, can you go back to the 20 versus 22 slide there for a second? Great. Um, so just to clarify, the ride share van pool uh, delta, you know, it's, it's the exact, you know, same, just on different sides, negative, positive. Is that, is that the reallocation that you were speaking to earlier? Um, Can you explain why they're the exact same number, just one's positive, one's negative? Sure. Um, so we have gotten these two separate grants for a few years now. The DRPT Rideshare Grant pays for our Commuter Assistance Program. The mm -hmm. DRPT Vanpool Grant pays for our Vanpool Assistance Program. So they're pretty similar. Um, it's just a matter of who, kind of who we're helping. And so we had made an adjustment between FY20 and FY22 
too to better kind of account for how much time staff is spending on the commuter side versus the van pool side and that was the change so again we kept the overall funding level the same but we wanted to you know we, we track our hours through clockwise just as vanpo staff does and so we had a better understanding after that of well really we're spending this amount of time on commuter assistance and this amount of time on the okay yeah it was reallocation of time not not money got it okay yes yeah okay. all right so all right so but the but the bigger question then is if the if GW Ride Connect cannot be made whole, let's let's start with if we are looking at this <clears> level of funding right here, this delta of sixty five thousand. Talk about the index, and then let's go worst case scenario. If the DRPT grants are not funded, at least <clears throat> not at the requested levels, I'm guessing there may, there may be something. But um, just what 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 happens? What what's what's the concrete impact? Sure. Um, so we've already kind of made some adjustments to make the funding level at the $65,000 less mark work. Um, and so part of that was to reduce the executive director's time charged to GWRC or GWRI Connect for work on 5307. So that ultimately increases um, GWRC's indirect cost. Um, Beyond that, if there, if we do not receive the funding, then we start looking at, you know, making cuts to the program. Um, the first thing I would look to cut back on is our marketing costs, um, and then, you know, some other different line items. Um, but obviously, to keep kind of our most essential <laughs> um, uh, um, costs, and you know, ultimately, we would hope to keep staffing in place but um depending on the level of cuts that's always a concern as well all right, all right. thank you any other questions comments yeah i think this is going to be followed up um both um we have had offline discussions with PRTC, and I believe they're going to follow up with a presentation to the GWRC board, and there'll be further discussions at the tax side. I don't think this matters at an end, but I think it's going to be discussed further. Madam Chair, this is Manuch. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Ms. Manuch. Thank you. You may have already covered this, but I may have missed it. Um, what did you say that the total marketing costs were going to be of this? Um, our marketing budget for next year, I'm currently projecting that we'll have funding for $120,000. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm sorry. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Ms. Gibson. Thank you so much. All right. Next item on the agenda it has to do, I mean, maybe with CMAT and CBG funding. Uh, we'll do that call for projects update. Mr. Adam Hager. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening to the committee. Um, have just a quick snapshot update tonight for the CMAC and STBG call for projects process for FY 22 to 27. Of course, last month, the policy committee approved an amended CMAC and STBG methodology. Um, this now takes into account a benefit to the TMA for multiple project categories for STBG project applications. And then the policy committee also took action last month to direct us to do the call for projects. So we kicked that off on March 1st with our TAC. So just at a high level for the spring sort of season of getting these allocations done. Right now in March, we're doing application intake. So we have a due date of March 22nd. And then we're gonna be in a busy period for about two weeks of reviewing and scoring projects. And then we'll have some draft allocations for the policy committee to consider in April. Just a couple details on the process for this year. So we are asking applicants to submit no more than three projects and that includes existing projects. So our methodology does not um, offer a limit are asking just for the sake of our staff's time, uh, you know, given that we just have about a week and a half to score projects to limit mm -hmm. it to three. Also, the staff is working with VDOT regarding the amount of funding available. The budgets are likely to be less um, this year um, in light of COVID-19, so they look at sort of the revenues over the, the previous few years 
to project out that six-year outlay of, of budgets for each fiscal year. So um, we are expecting that to be less. Um, two other factors that are going to play into the amount of funding available is any potential 5307 allocations from GWRC. And then the policy committee also, back in September of 2020, um, approved fully funding UPC 115614. So this is the Market Street and Route 1 project in Spotsylvania County. So we, as a staff, are accounting for that as a part of this process for allocations for this year. We do have an online application form this year, so we made a quick little Google form for easy submissions. We are also allowing our applicants to submit via Word or PDF as well. As far as next steps, the application window, like I mentioned, will close on the 22nd. So we are asking for any and all applications by that date. And um, then we'll switch gears and turn to scoring from the 23rd to the end of the month. And then we'll develop a set of recommended allocations, and we do have in our methodology um, some requirements to work with VDOT on that process. We'll be doing that the first week of April, and then we'll have our draft allocations for TAC review on April 7th, and the TAC meets on April 12th. And so we, from that point, we have a pretty quick turnaround to the policy committee, um, which meets on April 19th next month. So I'm happy to take any questions, and I'll point out for everybody's reference that in the packet we have included the six-year outlay of projects that have CMAC and STBG funding, and this is current as of uh, January 25th, which is the last time the policy committee took action on the spreadsheet. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Do we have any questions for Mr. Hager, Mr. Ross? Sure. So in the past, I know that we've only allowed Fredericksburg, Stafford, and Spotsy to submit projects, but that changed this year. Is that accurate? I believe, Mr. Ross, in the in the past, and I, I can't speak to anything beyond last year, which was a special one-off year due to COVID and a lot of the conversations happening around STBG funding at the time, but I believe that PRTC um, applied for projects in the past, and then we do, of course, in the region have a few projects um, that are kind of special cases, like what Kate just presented with you know, GWRI Connect off the top, so that's not something that's a typical process, but our intention this year was given that the methodology is not as prescriptive maybe as we would hope it would be for questions like that that we said any any applicant that is eligible to receive these funding sources we are you know encouraging to apply so so I, i'm pretty sure this is the first year we've opened it up to everybody and it is concerning to me um that other agencies could take a significant amount of the cmac and STBG funding from other from the three of us. And like I, I already know, like Fred, Fred Bus can put in three on their own. Is that correct, or is that am I off on that? Fred is an app. They are an eligible applicant to receive CMAC funding. Did you say ineligible or eligible? They are eligible. Right. <clears throat> so, so I I don't know. Are we motioning to approve this or? Could I make a motion that would allow it to be just applications coming in from the city, Fredericksburg, or Fredericksburg, the city, Stafford, and Spotsy? Well, we we look at? Approved the, we've already approved this process. Ultimately, we, the policy board, decide on the big final decisions. I know we do. I, I just, we just heard about limited time and staffing. So you're right. Ultimately, we do approve it. But are we putting staff through unnecessary stuff if we're not going to approve those anyway? I'd like to know what they are, at least. I sit there and say no to anything. Okay. How, many, Go ahead. how many other organizations are eligible to apply? Like, can the Park Service apply for this? I think so. Yeah. I don't believe so. I think it's <clears throat> Adam. In our region, do we know how many other um, organizations are eligible? These would be the organizations that fall under the PRTC umbrella. So this would be FRED. Um, projects could also be going to OmniRide, you know, VRE as well. But um, that would be the, the universe of, of potential allocations right there. So FRED, OmniRide, and, and VRE, VRE would be plus the three. Right. Projects. And OmniRide, your project OmniRide is before and it pertains to their services that are in North Stafford anyway. I would assume that's what we'd be looking, they would be looking at getting funding for. Their current services in, in Stafford County. So, this is Vinuch. Go ahead, Ms. Vinuch. Sorry, Madam Chair. 
I'd like to just second that motion just because there's a lot of discussion going on. So I figured we might as well have it seconded. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. It was a point of order. Thank you. So we have a motion, uh, motion to, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ross, will you restate your yeah. motion? And so it would be that in, when we're considering uh, the work that's going on at, with 7D, the, the only Stafford County, Spotsylvania County, and the city of Fredericksburg can submit applications to be looked at. We're seeing that. Go ahead, Mr. Kelly. If I'm not mistaken, we went through and had a discussion to establish this methodology in the first place, which included all the changes that Stafford County wanted with regards to their funding to the north. And if I'm not mistaken, it was passed unanimously by all the jurisdictions. So I'm kind of surprised it's now jumping back and saying, oh, no, now we're going to change it again. So I'm not ready. And frankly, I would like to see what the projects are. Ultimately, the policy board makes the decision on those things. If you want to take a position from your locality and say we're only going to support, that's fine. But again, P PRTC might be bringing forward a project that's going to help more Stafford. Uh, Fred operates within this region, so I would like to be able to see projects, and if they are within our jurisdiction. So I don't understand where we're going with this, is what I'm trying to figure out. But Fred, Fred's eligible on their own. So then uh, what I'm just saying is, then why, then why do you want to say, and why should we have them come in if they can do it on their own? How are you saying that they can do it on their own? I thought they had three projects that they can put in on their own. Then what are we, then what are we trying to accomplish with it, with, your, with the motion? Without going through Pamper. I don't think they can do that. Ian? My understanding is, just let me just clarify my talk. My understanding, Adam, is that, that. Um, okay to two if Fred wanted to access CMAX funding, they would have to apply. They would have to apply through us. Through, through this process. Am I correct? There's no back door through which Fred can apply for CMAX funding that doesn't come through this process. I may have to confuse or something. Yeah, so, no, but, we've got to allocate the CMAX funding. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out why we're because again, ultimately, we decide, and the only projects they're going to have are within Stafford, Spotsylvania. Well, they could potentially be some King George, it could be some Caroline, but for the most part, it's going to be for us. And they'd have to have enough votes to win, and they would have to have enough votes to win. Sure. Yeah, well, okay. put it excuse me, there, I'm going to recognize Mr. Marshall, please. Is there anything stopping a locality from putting in for a project for free? No. For the full projects for? for? For Fred, for the Fred Buster. Say Spotsylvania wanted to add a couple bus routes. That was going to be a project. Spotsylvania put into that for Fred, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, point of clarification, um, Madam Chair, this is Jamie Jackson with Fred. Can I respond to that? Yes, ma'am, please. So for CMAC and RSTP funding, even though, um, you know, Fred is not a direct recipient, we have to go through the board, uh, this process right here. Uh, a jurisdiction uh, really can't uh, submit a project on behalf of Fred for a variety of reasons, including that we receive um, FTA funds. So we still have to report out all of our projects. All the uh, costs associated with a project um, still go through the budgeting processes processes for the three jurisdictions, so that needs to be considered. Um, just as a point of clarification for smart scale, we kind of went through a similar process with the state where Spotsylvania County um, wanted to submit a project on behalf of uh, Fred and uh, we were given the guidance that Fred could work with Spotsylvania, but since we were the operator of the service, we had to submit the project. Um, so, um, just a point of clarification and correction, Fred would only be eligible for projects or only operate projects that it would submit because ultimately it has, since we're a regional provider, impacts all three jurisdictions. So, so Fred would have to apply themselves and would have to come through this process there's under for CMAC funding. And CMAC SDBG, this is the only process that we have. Okay. That was my understanding, but I just wanted to get to their opinions. Madam Chair, this is Bob Schneider. Um, yes, Mr. Schneider. One thing I wanted to note is because this is a federal program, I don't think you can be 
exclusionary to jurisdictions, I believe, and we'd have to, you have to confirm that legally, but just um, for clarification, it, it is a federal program. So eligible entities under the law are going to be what um, ultimately it, those entities are permitted to apply for projects. I don't believe you can be exclusionary and prevent organizations that are eligible under the law. So just one thing to, to note. No, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Thank you very much, Mr. Snyder. Mr. Roth. So, Mr. Snyder, if you could send out that legal ruling to all of FAMPO, I'd be grateful because we've been breaking the law then for decades. Biggest. Okay. Go ahead. No, the biggest, the biggest brouhaha we had actually, and I don't know if Mr. Snyder was a, when we were doing some of the parking around here for VRE and we wanted to have city only parking lots, but because we use federal money, we could not exclude anybody or any group or anyone involved. But the feds are very specific about not being exclusionary and saying, and again, we're talking about projects that are going to be within the region and within our jurisdiction. So I don't see what the issue is. It doesn't. I'm going to talk here. I don't see what the issue is either, only because. Mr. Aulis has said that they're going to keep track of the time that people are using to score the projects, which is really our concern is that we don't want to waste time for projects that we know that we're not going to agree to. And so, but peace and love to them. Go ahead. And I think that my opinion is that they should go ahead and submit their projects. We can see them. We're the ones that ultimately make the decision on the usage of it. It's not RSTP. It's STBG. It's a STBG and CMAC money. It makes sense to me. So that's my personal opinion on it. Uh, we've had a motion, we have a second to, uh, to be able to exclude people. I think that uh, there's a, point, a question about whether that's even legal to do so. And uh, Mr. Ross, would you withdraw your motion? Yeah, yeah I'll withdraw it knowing it's gonna fail. Okay. <laughs> sure. I'll, with, I'll withdraw the second as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you, ma'am. All right, and thank you. And this was a discussion, not an action item anyway. It certainly remains the purview of Madam Chair of the Policy Committee to make the final decision anyway. So. Okay. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Though. All right. Uh, next item up is LRTP. Mr. Hager, are you going to cover that as well? We'll do it together, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, the prioritization methodology, this is for roadways. You've <laughs> seen this um, mostly before. Um, we've just made a couple of updates. We've done some new things, a proof of concept. We looked at existing projects. We scored them using our system and compared them with the um, smart scale scoring. And you'll see later on that um, we come with a very similar outcome, although it's not exactly the same. Next slide. Um, we've looked at our NPO counterparts and looked at what they're doing and they suggested this overall we looked at our prioritization methodologies as a task in the uh, UPWP many as you know uh, MPOs are doing the same process so I don't want to belabor this next slide this is the slide that answers Mr. Kelly's question from last uh, time's policy committee meeting the smart scale measures in our system will make up 60% of the total score. So it's still 40% of the total score, which is not a smart scale uh, type of system. So the statewide coordination we're looking at, and then the project benefit measure, that 30%, that looks at the qualitative aspects of these projects, where you can't always decide <clears throat> on a project purely on um, data. There are some more subtle aspects to a project that you need to look for other measures. For example, does it fit? Does it connect to the north-south corridors that link us uh, to DC and Richmond, for example? You could look at other measures that are not, and we've looked at a project benefit measure to look at some of those other um, ways of scoring projects. But you can see the smart scale takes up the plot of it. We've looked at their categories, safety, congestion, mitigation, accessibility, and so on. Next slide. Um, this is getting into the weeds, and I don't want to get into each one of those um, line items. They're in your pack, and I'm sure you've had a look at them. I think these have been in your pack more than once, and they've been to the packs more than once. It takes a long time to go through every line item, and I don't want to do that. They are all there. 
there's the scoring. So if you look at that slide, Madam Chair, the green, the, the green column is um, our scoring, and you can compare that to the scoring of the um, smart scale, and they're very similar, you will see on the following slides. Those are, those are current projects that we've scored to see what the outcome will be. It's a random sampling. And there, if you compare, you can see on the green column for those of you in the room, the scoring, and that's uh, without looking at the dollars. So we haven't done a calculation in this particular scoring, looking at the cost of the project. We've just scored them based on the criteria. Next slide. Uh, we've not included those bike bed projects in that sample scoring, um, and we've not accounted for costs. There's a relatively strong correlation between how they would feature in smart scale and how they would feature in our scoring system. Um, the RTP scoring is out of a possible 10 points based on merit. Smart scale scored. Uh, relative size, uh, ranking project for each evaluation measure, and the output values are not exactly one as to one. So we're going to do a virtual workshop for people who want to get into those numbers, those details, those line items, to actually see exactly how the calculations are done. There is the date and time on the 19th of March. It's going to be online, so anybody can participate, but we particularly ask the tech members to come along and attend that so that they can go through those calculations. So you can see how exactly we're doing those particular calculations in the road uh, section of the scoring methodology. We'll be bringing it back then to our April policy committee meeting for approval. So you will approve hopefully the road scoring methodology in April at your meeting. And we're, as we've said before, working on transit projects TA projects and uh, what they call active transportation, which is bike and pet projects and so on. Next. Next slide. Ian, yeah, that's the last slide. Okay, thank you. So, Madam Chair, it's very detailed, and I didn't want to at this policy committee meeting go through all of the detail, but I've got Adam and the other staff here. If somebody does want to ask a technical question, You've had them all seen your facts. Yeah, I'll be attending that meeting. Go ahead, Mr. Jones. I guess just two points that we're getting out of the planning component and getting a little bit into the political component and looking at this. Because to not look at this with the funding component, when that is basically what's been biting us in the year and what on most of these projects, because we don't have enough funding available to grow in to match or to our projects. And two, in the last few rounds, what has become pretty clear, as opposed to being just project by project by project, the successful projects are the ones, and I, I know everybody's been thinking this way, especially in this last round, is how do we take a, quote, transit project, parking lot, trail, whatever, and marry it with a road project to get it funded? Are, you gonna, well, are we going to get those components in this discussion at some point? So... The good news is that when you look at the way that we've scored projects using the current projects that were um, approved in SmartScale, we got a very similar scoring. When you look at our final score, how we would rank them, how SmartScale ranked them, is very similar. So the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If you can match the way they would have scored it, and we get the same or very similar scoring, um, your projects are going to receive the same kind of rating when they go to smart scale. So that's you're, not, you're not factoring in the money factor. Yeah, but even so, it's still coming out similar to this. If we then do that last step, which we started some work on, Matthew has done um, cost-benefit analysis, we can present that at the workshop. Okay. There are two dangers with that, though. The first one is, some of the projects in the LRTP are a lot more speculative than the projects that go to smart scale. Because by the time they get to smart scale, they've changed. So the content of the project has changed. 
because they've added on a bike path, but they didn't add it on when they sent the LRTP one because the LRTP doesn't allocate money per project. Right. So people then take what they submitted to the LRTP and improve their applications when they send it to smart scale. So the cost benefit that you do is not based on all the same elements that are going to go into smart scale. And the second problem is the actual cost that they indicate is usually a bit rough. It's not. And some of these projects are years out. So by the time you actually put it in, the cost is changed. So the two moving parts are that people change their projects, which everyone does, and the cost in today's money is not quite the same when you finally get it into small scale. So we'll do that calculation and we'll show it in the workshop, but it's a little bit kind of artificial what we're doing. But it, it is artificial, but that is the, the there is what I'll call the theoretical mathematic, which you have done. And for great job, staff, everybody's done a great job. But then it rolls into the political financial realities of what has happened with smart scale. And I just want to make sure that we are not losing the realities to which we will face in the next round. So. We'll do the funding comparison. Okay. But you will find that it's only going to help you a little bit with scale. So the bigger projects go to the small projects. That's all it's really going to do. Because mm -hmm. the rest of the numbers are a little bit of a thumb sucker until we get into the actual smart scale scoring by others. We don't do those scores. So we'll be able to show what potential leverage funding would do to a project on its funding numbers. Well, you, we'll do a cost benefit analysis. So you'll see it's expected to be a 10 billion project or 100,000 project. And what the, when you divide the cost by the, by, the, by the benefit, you'll see what kind of range it's in. But it's. I understand. But with a bit of the data, that basically, they, they use a number. And, and one, of, one of the drawbacks they've been having recently on this smart scale is to your point is they awarded it based on a number, which by the time the project's getting ready to move out, that number has changed, and all of a sudden we don't have the funding we have for the next round, it's having to be diverted into other projects. We'll, we'll give you a sample of the numbers so you can see what happens okay. when we do that. Yeah, but it's yeah, Mr. Different. Kelly, I share your concern, so join me at that 19 March meeting. <laughs> so I, I uh, this isn't that hard, but anyway. I think Jason's got a question. Madam Chair. Mr. Brennan. Thank you very much. Um, so question on why there is a separation between these uh, service transportation projects and TDM or, or active transportation projects. So these are runway projects, right? Right, but why why why, why separate them in the scoring? Because, well, I don't kind of jump into this, but it's because the criteria used for things like a parking lot or a bus system are a little different to the criteria that I use to score a roadway. That's a simple answer, but I mean, I don't, I'm sure we'll want to elaborate on that. Sure, I can jump in. That That is sort of it in a nutshell, Mr. Graham. I, you know, what it comes down to is we want to find um, objective criteria for each mode, and it's really difficult to normalize the output when you look at different modes of transportation. So if you're trying to evaluate safety for a transit project, so say you're applying for new operating assistance for a new bus route, it's really hard to measure the safety, even if you it's you know the same percentage, we'll say 12% like we have here for the roadway, compared to a project that improves an intersection to make it more safe for you know vehicular traffic, for example. So what we've tried to avoid is having to come up with a very complex calculation to normalize across different modes and just treat them all as their own subset. And I can and I can understand that. I guess I would just hope that we could maybe get to something more universal, uh, you know, because thinking about some of the TDM and some of the active transportation projects, you know, we know that active transportation is going to be, you know, at, at scale is inherently safer than individual car traffic because people bumping into each other doesn't kill anybody just for to take it to its extreme it, right you know a, a public transit system is going to be safer than individual car traffic so, simply because of the lack of vehicles on the road you know you are you risk the, you know fewer fatalities fewer accidents with fewer vehicles 
And what I what I'm concerned about with this separating everything into buckets, it you know to you know piggyback off of, uh, you know off of Mr. Kelly's comment, you know the the one constraint that we do have is money, and you know I I would like for us to you know recognize the value of these bike ped projects and TDM projects against you know some of these road widening projects so that we can see the value of these projects when compared to the traditional surface transportation projects. And so when we do face these hard realities, we start to come to the recognition that prioritizing these active transportation and TDM projects is a better choice for the individual localities and for the region as a whole. And that's why I'm hoping we can try to find a way to bring them together. Otherwise, I'm concerned we're just going to keep making the same types of decisions that we've been making for the past you know, decades uh, before now. I I hear you. I mean that is a that is a concern. That there is one difficulty with that, and that is it's very difficult to come up with an objective criteria and metric that you can rank in numbers when you're comparing apples, oranges, and bananas, because any metric that you pick is gonna favor one against the other. Let's say you pick length, the bananas are gonna win because they're longer. If you pick round this, the you know the orange is going to win. So the trouble is here yeah, with these as well, finding objective metrics to measure things that are inherently different becomes humongously difficult. And other NPOs around the state and around the country are finding that that's the same problem. The alternative is you choose very generic metrics, and then the staff or the politicians end up making a judgment call rather than an objective metric call. So you then have to make a judgment call. Is this one safer than that one or not? Well, if you can't use an objective criteria, you then have to make a judgment call as a panel, which becomes more of a political decision. And the danger with that is when you have a fight, who's going to win? It's, so we're trying in the staff to come up with objective criteria based on what is happening elsewhere, what other people are using, what smart scale has been using, and we look at smart scale, and things like smart scale score projects um, in in categories in different ways. They don't score a bus the same way that they score a roadway widening, simply because they're quite different um, modes of transportation. You will have to realize that no funding gets put to these projects when they're still in their RTB. They have to get into other vehicles for them to receive funding. So in the LRTP, there is not a need to, to, to score them relative to each other in the way that you described, because we're not going to have this list and smart scale, they're just going to give money to that list. They're going to start all over again when they score, and they're going to score them according to their system. And we don't have control over their scoring metrics. Remember, we don't have smart scale metrics. They review them once every day, so many years, and then they're fixed, and they apply that, and we don't have any input into that. So when the money gets applied, it's no longer our decision in smart scale. Here, we're trying to mimic something a little bit like smart scale, so that our scoring is relatively similar, so that our projects would do relatively well when they go into smart scale. That's mostly what we're trying to achieve. And sure. we take the same approach of Scoring roadways against roadways, transit against transit, and bike and pet against bike and pet. So that the better bike and pet projects get to the top of the queue, the better transit projects get to the top of the queue, and the better bike projects get to the top of the queue. Or all right, so I mean, if, if, so if the purpose of this is to get smart scale funding or to, to predict what we think is most likely to get smart scale funding, that's fine but if it's for our own lrtp i would also hope that we'd start to consider even you know generic metrics like average commute time you know number of fatalities during transportation or number of you know you know serious injuries during transportation things like that that would you know across you know ac across modes of transportation just so we can start to recognize the difference between the two and and start to see in hard numbers you know what these road widening projects do versus TDM and active transportation. I just want to make sure that we have an opportunity for that to be shown out during the data and not to continue to put blinders on and to think that 
everything's fine by just by widening the roads. Uh, uh, Mr. Graham, thank you very much for your comment. That's going to be the last. I'm going to wrap this up very quickly because we're going to bring it back. I just want to end it that I totally agree with you, Mr. Graham, and that whole concept of creating that portfolio that's integrated that gives us the right view of where we want to put our money, and it might be all by that. I mean, I don't know what that looks like. I agree with you that we need that view, and it needs to have funding associated with it. So this meeting is going to be noticed. We can all be there on March 19th. Let's go. All right. Moving on. Thank you very much for the discussion. I, I'm really passionate about it, just like you are, Mr. Graham. So looking forward to that. Uh, resolution 2121, reappointing uh, Mr. Dustin Savage as uh, a... Sorry, can skip the 2045 LRTP amendment up there? I'm sick of LRTP. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a quick no, one. Sorry. This is a quick one, Chair. I won't belabor this one. This is the current LRTB. We have to. Uh, I mean, the simple answer is we have to amend it just because of some of the things that I believe have happened um, in smart scale. Am I right, Adam? Yes, that's right. So that's all it is. So we're busy doing that. That's all you need to know. If you want the short version, I can get you to your dinner quick. Oh, that's not the concern. But it's in our package. <laughs> no, 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 no. My apologies for skipping over. No, no, it's in your pack. It's just an update. That's why we need to do it. That's Thank you, Mr. Key. Any questions for Mr. Ollis on the 2045 LRTP amendment update? Okay. Thank you. Now moving on to resolution 2121. Thank you, Mr. 2121. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Dudenheffer. Um, is there any discussion? All who agree, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Next item is resolution 2122. Madam Chair, I move 2122. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Do we have a second? Second. Mr. Ross, uh, do we have any discussion? All who agree, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Say nay. Any abstention? Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Next item on the agenda is our transportation alternatives funding update. Ms. Barber, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is just a quick update on transportation alternatives funding for Stafford. They're going to be transferring the rest of previous funding from Onville Road to Flatford Road sidewalks. I'm working with Susan Gardner at VDOT to get the transfer paperwork taken care of, and we will have a resolution for your approval next month. And I'm happy to take any questions. Do you guys have any questions? Hearing none, moving on to item A, correspondence. I understand that we've not received any correspondence. Chair, uh, we've not received any of that kind of correspondence, but we did at the very last minute today get a letter saying that our Title VI review has been approved and we've passed with flying colors. So thanks to Stacey and the team for the work they did. We've got our letter from the government. We're done. Well, thank you for that. Congratulations. That was, that was well done. Well done. Uh, do we have any staff and agency reports? None apart from what I've already done in my presentation. Madam Chair, this is Marcy with VDOT. Yes, ma'am. Um, just wanted to remind the locality that there will be a transportation alternatives program workshop on April the 4th, and that's for 23 and 24 funding. And then on April the 29th, there is a revenue sharing workshop for fiscal years 27 and 28, and that the SMART portal opens on May 17th for both of those programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna ask the localities, is that news to y'all? You guys knew this, right? You're aware of it? Okay, good. But thank you very much, Ms. Parker, I appreciate that. Uh, do we have any board member comments? And I'll start with the people that are physically in the room. No comments? All those online, do we have any board members that wish to make any comments? Hearing none, the next item on the agenda is to adjourn the policy committee meeting. So, thanks. Motion and a second. 
No discussion. My only discussion point is to congratulate the policy committee. This is the third meeting in the row. It's fully correct and 100% yes vote on every item again, three mm -hmm. times in a row. So well done. Oh, no, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. All Shh. Shh. Aye. Aye. Any names? Chair of both time, motion <laughs> passed. Where uh, next meeting will uh, meet at April 19th on 2021 at 6 p.m. And uh, that will be before the round of meetings that Ms. Parker reminded us of. Thank you guys very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Jane and I to meet. Yeah.